The Harvard University Herbaria houses uh, five million uh, specimens, which makes it the largest university herbaria in the world. And it was founded in uh, 1842 by Asa Gray, who is um, essentially the father of, uh, of American uh, botany. Because of its age and its large holdings, it has some of the most important collections from especially North America uh, and particularly the United States, but also uh, from areas across uh, Asia. The collections themselves are a bit complicated in terms of how they're organized. They're all integrated under one roof, but there are many individual collections that are integrated. So we have obviously the Gray Herbarium, the Arnold Arboretum Herbarium, the Oaks Ames Orchid Herbarium, the Farlow Collection, which includes fungi as well as other cryptogams, the Economic Botany Collection, and finally the New England Botanical Collection. Those are more focused on the research and education side in terms of the larger public face to the world, there's also the Botanical Museum. So right now we are on the third floor of the herbarium. We're in what's called the compactor space and um, we're, we're standing in between two compactor rows right now and this whole space was recently renovated to just allow for the collection to expand and grow. Um, we were starting to get a little bit crammed with new incoming specimens coming in so having these compactor spaces just allows for um, our collection to keep growing and we currently have over five million specimens. We're one of the largest herbaria in the world. One of the challenges going forward is how to best serve and present these collections to the world. And digital imaging has provided a real advance in terms of how we make our collections accessible. And by and large, with the exception of specialists that visit our collections or loans that we send out to other institutions and specialists, they have been largely unavailable. And so efforts to digitize these precious resources really make them much more um, broadly relevant to um, not only biologists that are interested in studying um, the kinds of diversity, but in asking sort of large, larger questions about changes in biome, especially as we think about um, global climate change. And here, what we're doing most recently is really scaling out and scaling up the use of our collections to study the impacts of global climate change. And so today we're using a, a kind of a large conveyor belt, which helps to rapidly cycle these images through our, um, our, our camera uh, apparatus. And then we're capturing data that we can then tie to each and every one of those collections. And here we're targeting both species that are responsive to climate change as well as those that aren't. And then what we anticipate doing is to compare those collections and information in terms of flowering time response to what we know from these on-the-ground field observational data like those that were collected by uh, Thoreau. So we can, in other words, ask how faithfully do these collections represent flowering time uh, from the real world. And one of the ways in which we're helping to facilitate data collection is by crowdsourcing these efforts. So we're working with software engineers um, here at Harvard to develop a crowdsourcing platform in which gardeners and um, uh, uh, the general public that are interested in climate change can get interested in this, in this sort of work and play a role in citizen science. Charles Wright was a plant collector. His, he was born in 1811 and lived through uh, 1885. He was from Connecticut, educated at Yale, and traveled around quite a bit botanizing and teaching and eventually became a collector for George Engelman in Missouri and Asa Gray here at the Gray Herbarium. And he, through those contacts, became the chief botanist at the Ringgold and Rogers a uh, North Pacific exploring expedition that began in June 11, 1853 through March 16, 1854. And these are materials that he worked on along the way, including his journal, which talks about him leaving the port, an itinerary, and uh, a diary, and a manuscript that he worked on on Arctic Asian plants. There's also a picture of him here. You can see he was a really handsome fellow. We had a graduate student recently 
graduate from the History of Science department, and through his work on Asa Gray and Asa Gray's influence on Asian botany, he came back and told us that this itinerary is not actually one for Charles Wright, but of his assistant James Small. And he was able to deter determine that by learning more about the ships that each of them traveled on and the ports that they landed in when they collected their plants. So research on these materials often gives us new information about what they really are, and we really value that. The other collection we'll be digitizing is the Miscellaneous Plantless Collection that consists of 13 different volumes of plant lists of things that were accessioned as they came into the Gray Herbarium. The two that we have out are Fendler's Plants of Venezuela collection and Miss Mary Day's New England Old Nantucket Plant collection. Fendler was quite a prolific collector and his materials reside in many different herbaria, including the Smithsonian. The thing about collection lists when they come in is often the collectors make lists, the herbarium make num they number things, and then sometimes when they get mounted on specimens, another number is added. So over the years, plant list numbers can become very modeled. So having access to collectors' notes and plant lists often help resolve the confusion. You can see in this list that you, well, you don't know that, but I can tell you a lot of this is in Asa Gray's hand, various other hands, and there are a lot of question marks here. So I think it's interesting that what, as these came in, they're all new, and he's identifying what he can, but he's leaving question marks about the things he really needs to learn about. We're here in the GPI room, the Global Plants Initiative um, scanning room, and this is where most of the work for the project happens. Our daily workflow usually just includes taking the actual physical type specimen um, and making sure that all of the metadata associated with each specimen um, is correct and up to date. Um, you can see each specimen here has a unique barcode number. And within our database, once you put in this barcode number, it will pull up all of the information associated with this specimen which is also the case in the JSTOR database as well, along with the image. The main step for this process is uh, using the herb scanning machine, and these machines were actually built specifically for this project. Then for each specimen that we scan, we place this color bar and a ruler. Um, each herbaria involved with the project um, uses a ruler with their um, institution logo to place on the specimen. and then this is raised up. The um, bed of the scanner is made of foam so that it, it gives a little bit when the specimen is pressed up to the glass and that just reduces the likelihood of um, the specimen uh, getting damaged or breaking. And we use Photoshop on our Macs here to do the actual scanning of the specimens. Um, we preview the image and then we crop it the way that we want it to look and then we scan it. And we're scanning these at 600 dpi, so it's a very high resolution scan um, and it usually takes about two minutes for the scan to complete.